YouTube, Brian Phillips here again. Part six here on the flaps mod. As you can see, we've got both sides hinged. <coughs> we have a hinge in here that allows this gap to open, and two hinges here to allow this to pivot on this axis, and then it rocks up. This side works pretty decent and this side is a little bit sticky not so much that it won't work but just a little bit on the edge of resistance so I want to show you one little trick take your run of the mill kicker and just put a little drip of that onto the hinge and what that's gonna do is that's gonna break down the glue that you may have gotten onto the hinge you don't hardly need any just just enough to kinda wet the surface and what that'll do is that'll we're not worried about the kicker um, activating any CA or anything like that we're just trying to basically make it break down the mucilage glue That's amazingly effective. Okay, but we don't want to break it down in here where it's actually holding the parts together. It's hard to explain this on the video, but you can tell from the way it springs back too that it's got a little bit of resistance compared to this side that's less prone to springing back. When you get these complex shapes like this, it's near impossible to get a smooth movement a smooth action. I mean I tried my best <coughs> and it was uh, quite challenging. But either way we're at the point now where we have to go ahead and start trying to set up our uh, servo controls to actually um, make this work. And this becomes a challenge because we've got one, two, three pieces and we're trying to actuate it from one control. So, I mean, typically the rule of thumb would be you'd want to kind of control it from the middle. But I don't want to put so much weight outboard. I want to try to keep it inboard as much as possible. And I'd really like to keep it in front of the CG. But that gets difficult because there's just not much room in front of this is a, a wood strip I've taped over it. But this balsa wood strip is supposed to stiffen the wing. Of course, it's completely ineffectual, probably because I didn't glue it enough. Um, but the idea is the location I've got for where this control arm is compared to where this control arm is, it's very, very close positionally between here and here, and then triangulated so that we're kind of in the same spot so we can pick up that same point on the control surface because we really don't care uh, what direction the servo is facing beyond the fact of symmetry on the wing and the overall look of the wing but we're going to cover this up it's going to be either painted white or it's going to be covered with a small piece of paper or plastic or something like that so anyway without further ado I think what I'd like to do there's one other complication too we have to address and that is that we have a little bit of play here because the way that this hinge allows for a little bit of play and then this is allowed to pivot because we have our pivot points going like this right here and right here so that's important so that we can make this transition from here to here okay so what I'd like to do is I'd like to pull from both sides and brace to both sides and what that'll do for us is it will actually force it'll take this out of the equation because we'll be holding on to it and when this when this is locked in the down position it's going to strengthen this when it's in the takeoff position it's going to be less prone to have that that deviation there just because it holds itself in that uh, correct orientation there so anyway that's my next step <clears throat> it's a lot easier said than done I know from experience. <laughs> so 
Well, what do we do for control? Control rods, well, you could do a, you know, like this threaded rod, the 256 inch rod like this, but it just ends up getting very heavy. So I've just pretty much always gone straight to music wire. And I like music wire the best because for one, it's quite inexpensive. For two, you can get a lot of it and keep it in stock easy, which is nice. I use this KS uh, Precision Metals. Three, you can stock a lot of different sizes of it easily. And then of course there's always the, the fact that you can solder it together if you need to make a, a complicated um, fixture. Now I don't know for sure if this is music wire yeah, that'd be music wire that I got with my, I got that with my ASH-26. So I, I kind of like to stay with stuff I know I can get replacements on. And I want it to stay as light as possible initially, and then we'll increase the size as needed. So it looks like this is the same stuff. This is stock number uh, 501. KS Precision Metals. Evidently it's made in the US, but I'd like to go to this bigger size. Where's my bigger size? Oh, there we go. There's 497, which is one millimeter. So that's a little bit bigger than this. This stuff is like 0.81. Yeah, that's 0.81 millimeters. This stuff is one millimeter. So it should be a little bit stronger for us. And I'm actually getting kind of short on this stuff. The last time I went to the hobby shop, they didn't have it. I've got it on my list of things to buy. But of course, if they don't have it, you can't buy it. So then I always check the fit just to see if I'm going to get lucky enough to not have to screw with the, uh, the control horns. So these horns are the same ones that came in there, so I can go ahead and use these as a test. Now another trick, if you're looking for something to actuate the flaps with, a lot of times you can use these as you can actually cut them in and glue them to the control surface. And then you can use that as your control horn on the control surface. Okay, so I'm just going to size with this. Yeah, it'll actually fit. It'll be a really tight fit. And just be careful. These things like to shoot off when you're at the last little bit. And you'll be wondering what the heck you're using. Okay, so the way that I start my process is pretty simple. I just make a Z-bend. And I like to keep them as tidy as possible on the end especially. And that's important so you don't have huge amounts of slop. But you can see I'm just using this regular run-of-the-mill tool. Nothing special about it. Just happens to be nice and small. You can buy a Z-Bend tool if you'd like. But I just... Uh, I don't like tools that only have one purpose. I try, I mean, yeah, I've got lots of tools that are like that myself. I get it, but <clears throat> I prefer to have a multi-purpose tool. So, what we can do now is we'll take and test it for fit. to see if we're going to be able to get this through once we're over on the plane. Okay, so we can definitely get it in there, but we're not quite square. Okay. So now that we're square, we'll go in here like this, 
And see that little bit of play, believe it or not, can cause all sorts of grief later. So if you don't want to have the grief later, you can try to deal with it now if you can. It's hard to get a whole lot tighter than that, I'll be honest with you, on this smaller wire. And that might be an argument somebody would use for buying the Z-Bend tool. Now the other thing you can do is you can take and actually cut a uh, you can cut one of the tips off of these slide that in there with your control arm and it'll make like a shim. It actually works pretty good <clears throat> most of the time. Okay so when this is on here we're going to need to reach out to the control surface of course and then we're going to need to adapt to something like this. Let's just say it's something like this, not this exact thing. Okay. Now I'm not married to this exact position, but I'd like to try to make it as close as possible. And obviously the best approach would be to make it attach to just one surface and make everything work fine. But I have no reason to, you know, I have no reason to say for sure that's going to work. Boy, that that kicker really made a big difference. I, I'm surprised how good it worked. I knew it would work. I just didn't know how good it was going to work. It worked really good. So, <clears throat> I almost always do a mechanical adjustment bend somewhere in my work because I don't usually have like threaded rod. So I'll do it like this. I'll just do one of a couple of different ways. This is one way I do it. I'll fold it over like this and then I'll bring it all the way over onto itself like this. So I'm just holding that tight. Now that's a pretty big adjustment but I do that on purpose because this is going to end up being you know a lot of guess and check and then sometimes I'll even go back and just remake them without the adjustment once I get everything set because it's so easy to do it. Okay, so that's our initial initial operation. Of course, ours will probably go like this. <clears throat> Except it's not. It's going to go like this. Like that. So that'll clear everything. And then this needs to go out to something like here. So now, if you have a strong enough, robust enough setup, you can use pliers like this. And you can usually cut through this wire, but it is hard on, it's hard on your tool. You'll eventually, you'll dull your tool down. And uh, definitely should use some safety glasses for these steps. Okay, so that's going to basically give us a, a less, slightly less sharp edge. There's your initial start there. Now we're going to take this and we're going to put it in the flat. We're just going to spin it until it's to the angle we want. Okay, there you go. So there's our initial piece. Much easier to work with now, of course. And I would argue that now would be a good time to go ahead and get the uh, the servos wired up so that we can start seeing the action of the servo. So in order to do that, we have to peel this tape off and gain access to our servo channel. Kind of like I did on both sides of these wings. I'm not going to show both sides because it's the exact same thing twice. Um, but I'll probably show hooking up the wires here just because it's technically going to be together. Now what I might do, because I really like the way that this turned out in terms of looks, this paper. I might go ahead and just reuse this paper depending on how things go. This is taped on top of there. And you see that finish. I don't know if you guys can see that in the video. But it's pulling that clear coat off. 
that clear coat's going to be ineffective under there anyway. So now watch what I do. I'm just going to peel this at a 45. And I'm going to just stick that back down. So we're done there. And then this, I want to keep the position true where it is. So we're just going to rock this and just peel that tape out from under it. Okay? So if we were going to reuse this, I could actually just lay this down on another piece of paper and trim it out. Or I could actually just cut the plastic away. So I think I might, for now, do this. I actually kept this um, from the kit. So I actually have the factory. Um, and you see I, I glued all these wires down to keep them in the channel neatly. I think that was probably a good call. Because otherwise it would be a huge mess by now. Now obviously we're not going to be able to get all the wiring tidied up. And you can see that we're actually going to be able to reach into the cab, into the cabin of the plane, if you will. But just barely. So we're going to need to have an extension cord um, to even get this done. And we know that the extension cord is going to ultimately be a Y cable at some point. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and just dig into my bag of goodies here. We're going to look for a Y cable. And I usually, the way I organize these is I've got a like male to male short extensions. And there you go. Those are splitters. Okay, here's servo Y cables, male to female, one male to two female, which I believe I have my nomenclature wrong on those, but that's all right. <clears throat> I don't honestly know exactly how long I need this Y cable to be. So I think for now, for testing, okay, these are extra long extensions, okay. I think these are my Y cables. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically put that in. Seems like I'm missing a bag here. We're going to plug that into the receiver. Let's see how long these ones are. That might actually be about right. See, because we only have to make it from the receiver out. But just keep in mind the cable management usually doesn't work quite as clean as you want it to. You know what? I just got done telling you we're not going to show you both sides. So I'll go ahead and pause it while I peel this off. But we're going to get both sides uncovered. All right, folks, so I got the uh, the other axis off, and I've plugged in one of the two extensions, or excuse me, the uh, the servo signal splitter. And I'm going to use that to feed the cable through into the inside here of the plane. Okay, so we'll just kind of wiggle that in there. And then here in a minute, when I flip this over, we'll just have to dig that out. I'm sure it'll be super fun. Alright, so... So it's not wanting to come through very easy, so what I'll do is I'll actually take and feed these uh, forceps through. I tuck this in here for storage, in case you're wondering. So I'm going to set this up like this. I'm going to try it this way first, because it's the safer way to do it. So I grab it so that the metal will protect the the cables as I go through and then I just kind of poke it through like so I'm not I'm not clamped onto it because I don't want to damage it see there it is guys okay so now that we're through well what the heck I'll use the other pair of forceps to grab it out of there now on this side I'll go ahead and hang on and then I can just 
remove the forceps from behind it. Just like that. And in you go. And then whichever side's attached, I'll be nice and leave it. Now you could do this either direction. I just figured this would be the easier way and who knows, maybe this wasn't the easier way. Just be careful you don't ding up your finish all over the place. <clears throat> There's only so much room in that, that entry hole there. It's actually surprisingly tight. You want to try to avoid tugging on these servo cables because they're not very strong usually. Okay, so we've got that in now. And just keeping in mind that this is going to be flopping around potentially. So I'd really like to go in and under, if at all possible. But I don't know if we're going to have enough extra for that. Um, and to be perfectly honest, it looks like we're going to have enough extra to, to feed this under from a cable management perspective. You see what I'm doing, guys? I'm just going behind the, the ESC wires there. These planes get so stinking ridiculous for wiring. Especially when you got multi-engine setups like this. Okay, now I'm going to kind of do the same thing I did before. Except I'm using the servo extension to get out. Or the splitter in this case. Okay, so that's not going to work very good, so I'm just going to feed these forceps straight through. I'm just going to kind of work my way gently through. And what's so nice about these forceps is that they articulate way back here, so you can kind of slip them through and then open them up when you get into the opening, and the hinge point stays narrow. So if you can fit the head through, you can usually open them up once you get inside your work. See? There's the tip of the forceps. So you can bring them back far enough to where you can get a hold of whatever it is you're trying to grab and pull out like this. Okay, so I'm going to hang on to them. I'm going to very carefully try to walk it out, just giving it a little bit of wiggle. Oh, son of a gun. Well, we know that we're aligned more or less properly, so I'm going to go ahead and just work it out now. Okay, so now I don't want to actually go any further than I have to because, to be honest with you, this may end up being inside the plane and not outside. So I would say that, yeah, in fact, I'm about 99% sure it's going to end up in here. So I apologize, guys. This probably needs to be inside. Um, I guess I was thinking along the lines of the testing, but I probably should have been thinking along the lines of, I'm not going to do this again unless I have to. Okay, so we've fed that through. And can't quite see it yet. There it is. Okay. So now we're just going to open up the forceps. This, this is one of those tools where, you know, you're thinking to yourself, what the heck? Where do you even get those? Well, I got these at Menards, so... If you can get them at Menards, you can get them at other tool shops. And I use them all the time. Like, almost every time I'm doing a radio-controlled project. I use them when I'm setting up new planes, I use them. When I'm taking apart old planes, I use them. When I'm putting in LEDs, I use them. I mean, it's like one of those universal tools. I use it every single time I'm doing something, just about. And they're so much more useful than regular pliers. Okay, great. So I've got it in there. I can't necessarily say it's managed exactly the way I want right now, but it's good enough. See, like right here even. Goodness gracious. I'm going to hold this because I don't have enough room to get my hands down in there. And then I'm going to plug it in. Okay. So now that's in there. So worst case scenario, that'd be all you'd have to do. You don't have to make it neat. 
but making it neat will help you to catch it before it's a like a massive failure. Okay, so we're on aux one gear, rudder, elevator. Obviously, rudder and elevator are going to be consumed already. Gear is going to be reserved for stabilizer on off. So we're going to go into aux one. Okay, so aux one right there. All right, cool. So now we can go ahead and. I know it seems a little bit weird running this plane with half of the plane missing, but it's believe me, it'll work just fine. Throttle cuts on, gear switches down. Go to your system setup, yes, model select, scroll all the way down to wherever you got it. Here it is. Okay, so we got our plane pulled up, Airbus A380. So now we want to go into system setup, yes. We want to go to aircraft type, aileron, one flap. Now, for now, that's going to be correct, but if we end up doing the spoilerons, flap rons, so that we can simulate the, the spoilers and stuff, which we're pretty much for sure going to do, then that's going to change. So we might as well call it two ailerons and one flap, or we can call it flap rons, and then we just mix in the flaps, okay? I think on this one... I'm going to try this, and we'll see what that does, okay? So now our switch, throttle cut's made. I want to go to flap system. I'm going to turn it on to this switch. I always use switch B. Now switch B is going to control these with a two aileron one flap condition. If I have flap rons, then flap rons are going to be tied to the flap system by default in a spectrum system, just so you know, okay? Now the other thing is because we've turned on two ailerons, we have to separate the left and the right aileron because right now they're tied in a Y cable that's buried in one of these, which is going to be fun. You can tell which one it is because they're labeled here. Oh, thank goodness it's a top one. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so what I need... See, I just have hot glue. I just hot glued the stack together like this. So usually what I'll do is I'll, I'll take and cut these apart. And uh, that's a perfectly acceptable option in this case. So I'll go ahead and just go straight to the uh, cutting tool. I had somebody the other day tell me you can use alcohol to take off hot glue. Never heard of that before. I don't know if it's true, and I'm not going to try it on this project. Too many other things going on. But you can see right here, this is where the wires actually go in. So I can trim this right there. But this is like an extremely sharp knife, so I might be better served to use a hot blade for this. So, get a little heat going heat up the knife. Remember, we're not trying to cut anything. We're just trying to remove the glue enough so that we can separate these things, okay? All right, so there's that part. And then we're going to come in here and just separate it from the wall. And then we'll have to separate this and this. This would be the aileron over here. And then, of course, this would be the aileron over there. And you can tell just by the way they're laid out. I'm just lucky that it happens to be the, t the top of the stack. That was not by design. It was just pure luck. I didn't think this through or anything before. I thought a lot of other things through, but that was not one of them. I've got this bent blade. This bent blade will work good for this step because I can sneak down in here in between. So basically I'm just going between these two and that's just going to help us to separate these without damaging the connectors. You could also just damage the connectors if you want. I, Whatever suits your needs. And again, I this is kind of a strange time in the project to dig into this. 
but I honestly can't think of a, a time where it's going to be more convenient. So we're probably going to run out of time here in just a second, and we'll have to pick this back up. Okay, so I'm just trying to kind of find that middle point where I can get in between those two. Oh, shoot. I heard a popping noise, and I'm thinking it might have been this wire. And that's why you got to be careful when you're tugging on these things. I am going to quickly inspect that. Because I want to know if that broke the wire. No, I don't think it did. I don't think it did at all. We're good. Okay, so now that I've got that channel kind of started there, I can just get in there and wedge between these two Y cables. And all I'm going to do is try to separate these from the bundle. It's just not wanting to separate. I'm going to pause it while I fight this real quick. I'll come right back. Okay, guys, so that just popped off. So now we can work on it. And like I said, it's not real real hard once you get it separated. But we're going to take these two wires out individually and plug them into the respective position. Alright, so we'll just uh, go ahead and work on that real quick. We need to separate this. This is uh, another one of the Y cables. I'm not sure what that goes to. Oh, it goes to one of the ESCs it looks like. So now that we have access from this side, I think we can get in there with just a screwdriver. And once you get the screwdriver in there, you should be able to just kind of pry it back and forth until it pops free. It's just hot glue. That's part of the reason why you use hot glue. It's really only super strong when you get a bunch of different components that are glued together all in one big bundle and you're trying to be careful not to break it. Okay, so now that we have that separated, we can go ahead and cut this one out by taking our regular X-Acto knife. Um, and we'll go ahead and cut right down there so I'm actually gonna use the hot knife partly because I don't know where I laid my exacto knife and then partly because it'll be easier to make a clean cut so we'll just do a clean cut like that then we should be able to pull that straight out and then ready for the next project we can pull this off which is funny because we literally installed a Y cable and then we took another Y cable out Ironic, right? Okay, so now we'll just get in here with this still warm hot knife. And we'll just take and kind of break this stuff off. This is going to give us the ability to then separate the aileron channels from one another. The purpose of which is to give us our uh, spoiler on, flapper on. controls. Okay, I need a little bit more heat. There's my regular knife. Get that thing nice and toasty for this step. Because I really went to town on that glue. Okay, so once you get that warmed up just a little bit, you can just about just unplug them, I hope. Nope, not quite. Not quite yet. So I'm just going to let that heat do its job. Give me a spot to get a, a screwdriver in so we can wedge these two pieces apart. Yep, there we go. Once you get it started, it comes apart easy. Okay. Just like that. And then we can detach these fairly simply. Except for that spot is evidently still a little bit, a little bit bonded. Ooh, didn't stab myself that time. Congratulations to me. Okay, there it goes. It's amazing how fast those knives cool, by the way. Okay, so we've got this for another project. Um, put that in the test bin or whatever and test it when we get the next opportunity. Alright, so this servo will clean this glue off and this one goes to that one, to that aileron. 
So now let's look at, we're going to go to monitor. Right aileron is right after throttle. So throttle, then aileron. So the right aileron, which would be, this one's my right hand. So we can plug this one into the right aileron, which is going to be channel 2. Now these happen to be labeled with a name as opposed to a number on the Lemon RX. That's fine. If yours are numbered, then you would just go to the channel 2. Okay, so you see this? That one. That one goes over to that. So, I think I'll leave it on this side, but I'm going to untangle it from underneath those ESC wires. They were going to a common point before, now they're not. And additionally, I'm not sure if I want to tie that or not. Now I'm probably just going to leave it loose. I do want to clean off this excess hot glue. Hot glue that's not serving a purpose is just dead weight. Get it out of there. If it's serving a purpose, by all means have it. And I've used my fair share of hot glue in this airplane, which I normally don't do a lot of hot glue, but like controlling and maintaining positions of ESC wires, in my opinion, is almost always worth the extra weight. Some people would say that you could use a different adhesive, and they'd be correct. So you can do that on your plane. Okay, so I have something hooked up here, which is going to the bind channel. What the heck is that? Oh, goodness gracious, I have to think out loud for a second here. I have currently used differential thrust, throttle, because throttle one, throttle two, aileron, would be aileron for flap runs, elevator, rudder, flaps. That'd be five, six, seven. That may present a problem here because my differential thrust takes up the channel that I would normally use for my second flap. I may have to think about this. Because I have differential thrust, that means that I actually have used up the channel that I originally anticipated for all this active crap. That sucks. All right, I gotta think for a minute. I'll come right back. Okay, so that sucks. I don't want to give up my differential thrust because it's more effective than the actual rudder is. Um, but at the same time, the differential thrust also, because the tendency of the yaw, um, the, the rudder access to roll the plane, uh, rather than just yaw it flat, I have to depend on that for my controls. So if I give up this channel to give me this one really cool feature, then that means I'm actually going to be losing my differential thrust. Or I'll have to put in a second receiver that would also be bound, which would have to be DSMX or DSM2. You should be able to bind two of them of different types, but my experience has been when I do a DSM2, with the DSMX, I have all sorts of grief. One latches on, one never quite gets a full bind. I'm not sure why that is. You can bind one or the other, it doesn't really matter. Um, the radio will send signal and it will receive on the alternate one, but they never, they fight. So if you have a DSMX and another DSMX, like a 10 channel DSMX would be fine. Or you can downrate this to a DSM2. You can force this to run in DSM-2 even though it's labeled as a DSM-X. DSM-X, DSM-2 are compatible. Um, but DSM-2 with another DSM-2 configuration, you would be able to bind both of them simultaneously. Which means you would be able to gain those extra channels on the top. The lower channels would operate the same as your first seven channels. Or eight channels in this case. So if I added a 10 channel receiver from Lemon RX, I could use channel nine, in channel 10 uh, to operate differential thrust and then I could operate uh, my flap rons in this case on auxiliary 2 which is the bind channel um, it's actually auxiliary 2 plug it in through the bind plug port so anyway that all being said 
I think I'm kicking myself now because I literally just took this Y cable out and we're literally going to put it right back in. Um, but sometimes these things, you just run into them, you know? So I think for now, the more important function, like with the other option you could do is you could run flapperons and then not have flaps. Or you could run flaps on the gear channel and just share the top portion of that. But I don't know if I'm going to have enough deflection to actually operate these, these flaps. So I guess in my opinion, if I'm going to do anything like that, that still denies me the ability to do retractable landing gear for sure. <sighs> Maybe we'll try it that way first. We'll try it that way. If it doesn't work out, then we'll go ahead and put the Y cable back in. So for now, but that means we're going to have to redo our complete configuration for differential thrust. Not a very good position to be in, guys. I hate that this is only a 7-channel. It's actually technically an 8-channel receiver. I wish it was like an 18-channel receiver. Um, okay, so i got to do some thinking real quick. All right, so I'll think out loud, guys, so you can watch what I'm doing. So if I go to, if I go to my servo um, monitor mode here, you can see... My left and right ailerons right now are tied to these two channels. So I would be dictated uh, to use, I, I mean, I can reassign where this goes, but because my differential thrust is still hooked up, uh, throttle cut is on, by the way. So you can see it's not going to work. It will now. Okay, so it looks like auxiliary two. Okay, so this would be my other... This would be my other aileron, okay? So let's just plug that in for now, and we'll just run with it for a minute. And then the gear channel, which is our on-off channel for the stabilizer, will be plugged into the actual gear channel, okay? So right now, the gear channel is controlled here, which is going to... Um, I'll show you exactly what I mean here in a minute. I'm thinking I want this to be over on this side. I think we can make this work, but it's just going to depend on if I get enough deflection from my flaps. Because the, in the past when I've done this, the one time I've done it in this manner was on the ASH-26. And I did have good success, but it was a digital servo and they had a lot of throw, and I didn't need much throw to make the flaps operate. So I don't know if we're going to get so lucky on this one. But let's just go with it. Let's just run with it, guys. I'm really sorry to waffle so much on this part. I don't mean to drag you through the mud, but sometimes dragging you through the mud helps you to understand what the heck I'm thinking. Okay, so we're plugged into the gear channel now, which means that when we turn the stabilizer off, the flap servos will actuate, okay? That's an undesirable effect at this point. So we have to actually change it so that when we actuate the flaps, we don't actually turn our stabilizer off or on, respectively. Now, lucky for us, we have our master gain control, which is here, okay? So our master gain will give us the ability to turn on and off our stabilizer. But you see this? It's not tied to anything right now because I believe... Okay, hold on. It should be still. Nope. Because it got moved. My assignments got goofed up. Normally, auxiliary one... Excuse me, gear would not be set to flat, by the way. But it is, it is technically going to be flaps on this. Um, so I can live with that with the understanding that my servo setup for flaps is going to need to be set. Let's go to flap system. Let's just set it to, let's just set it to two different arbitrary set them, settings. Okay. So you see, see that? 
See how it's changing? Okay. So now let's go back up in your servo setup. Let's go to reverse. Let's reverse flap. Okay. See this? Now it's moving that way. Now let's go into. I've got to think about this for a second. I have to actually now make sure my stabilizer's on. So let's get a battery. My throttle cut's on. Uh, it doesn't need to be a fancy battery because we're not going to actually run the throttle. So we'll just use one of these crappy little test packs I've got. Yes, it's puffy, and yes, I wouldn't want to fly this plane, especially on this. Okay, so plug it in. Let everything initiate. Okay, so everything's initiated. The ailerons are working. May not be going the right direction. Doesn't really matter. Clearing the timer. Okay. So now you can hear the flaps. See how they're moving? Okay. So since they're moving, that that's always promising. And because these are moving, looks like we're going the right way. We also need to turn flapper on support on, which means that the stabilizer, when activated, which incidentally is not on because, see how this light is green and red? We're not within the range. So we would have to go to flap, excuse me, servo setup. And I want to change my range to 150 and 150. Okay, so we're on the wrong side of things. See how we're moving here? See how it's not changing? Because we're actually not in the correct range. So now I'm going to go to flap system. I'm going to change this to negative. It doesn't matter which direction it goes. It just matters that it's moving. See now our stabilizer. See our stabilizer's on? Gains all the way up. So it's working and it's off. So we get to the sweet spot where it's on and then it's off. And if you look, that's the sweet spot where it's on. Okay, so we have to operate in this range here. I know this is confusing for you guys. This looks like we'll do... We'll do positive and then we'll just flip the output again. So we've got like 75 then we'll go to like 150. Now if you use a digital servo, you may find that they go a little weird on you. So on the other sweep, we want to completely make it so it can't drop. So now watch what happens here. So we set that to zero. So now it's on the top box. Okay, now we're going to go over to reverse, and we're going to reverse the flap. So now you see what happens when we actuate the flaps. It's going down that way into the stabilizer on setting. When it's green, it's on. When it's green and red, it's off. Okay? So now that we've got that set right, we can go back in and change our range. So we want to actually make it so that when we actuate the flaps, we stay in this green range so it always stays on. Except it looks like I'm going the wrong way with that. So I'm going to set this... Ooh, we need the bottom to actually be all the way up. Okay. And then we want this other half to be all the way down. So we'll set this to negative, which allows us to move into the other range, just temporarily. Let me go back in. This is annoying, guys. It's just a matter of working with my particular radio system. Because I'm trying to cheat it out of that range where it's going to disallow this to, to ever shut off. Okay? So you can see we're off right now. Stabilizer's off. Now it's on. Now it's on. But we still have play within that range. Okay? I hope you guys are picking up on what's happening here. Now I can clear that to zero. Okay, stabilizer's on. See, it's on still. So now we just need to find the range 
Okay, so I want to set the neutral setting until that light turns to just green. Yep, there it is. So that now we're always on. Now the stabilizer is always on. Okay? Always on. And then, of course, we can adjust the master game. We'll make a mix that will do that. And then we give up nothing. We have, okay, so we have differential thrust, ailerons that will be allowed to operate independently with differential, which we can then tie to do spoiler ons. Oh my goodness, we're going to have everything if we can get enough throw. Okay, so let's go back over to throttle cuts on. Still on. So now let's go back to the neutral setting. And let's walk it back. Okay, see how it, see how it switches? So it's about, looks like 50 is safe. So I'll just leave it at 50 through 150. So our operational range is going to be 50, 75, 100. Okay? Then we can set this to like a two second deployment. Okay, so now let's back out of here. Let's go ahead and flip this all over. I want to be careful because my battery is going to flop around when I do this. So stabilizer is on. All right, cool. So this is kind of nice. We're going to have the best of both worlds provided we can get enough movement out of these servos. Okay, so watching. Okay, now the other thing too about this is we would have to just kind of like switch the servos around if we don't like the direction that they're moving. Now you can see the amount of play we're getting. That's not very much travel, guys. Not very much travel at all. And you're probably thinking, well, just open up the travel. Well, we've already done that here, guys. We already have it set to 150. So when it's at 150, that's the top of the range. And then when it's at uh, 77, that's the bottom of the range. Okay? So we only have one small part of this. I do not know if that's going to be enough to justify this move. So now I have to do some double checking. Now, the other thing we can do is we can put a longer linkage on which would give us an effective longer sweep like this you know what I mean so if we use that long adapter we might be able to get enough sweep to do the job but we're gonna have less torque on it I guess now is the time to find out right so if we're gonna put that on we need to cut Really, it doesn't matter which side we cut off. Except that we can't just re reverse the servos now. So we'll just cut this like this. What I just did is um, very strange. We're using all the channels. Oh, one more thing too. We have to set up a mix now too. Whoops, we've already got the mixes for the differential thrust. Okay, so new mix. Mix 7, it's normal. The mix is going to be um, switch D, so we'll just scroll over until it says D. D to auxiliary 2, or auxiliary 3. The rate's going to be like whatever we're at on auxiliary 2. We want it to go the other way. See how it's moving it back now on aux 3? So I'm just going to scroll this back. So no matter what the position is, so I want my master gain to be in control unless we come down to the middle or the bottom switch, okay? So really, I want to put it in the middle and this will be my offset. problem is right now we have no output on D so this is where it gets tricky okay so if we go here it's easy this settings easy 
because we have minus 100 right now on this switch position. So now we can just move it. We want this to be negative. See how it's moving this over? That's going to eventually turn off the stabilizer, okay? It's not going to actually turn off the stabilizer. It's just going to make effectively the gain all the way down. So I want to set this all the way to the bottom. Now, I understand I'm way past it, but that's fine. I just want it to go all the way past. See? Good, I got it. Okay, so now stabilizer's all the way on. See how it's working? Less, off, okay? So now I just need to make one more mix. Now there's one other thing you can do as a safeguard. You can set that to D as well. And you can make it so it's only active in one and two, okay? So now you'll go down here to, to the next one. You'll do another one, and you're gonna make it exactly the same. This is how you get extra throw. Okay, so this one's gonna be D compared to aux two again. Or you can do aux two to aux two, but you only want it to be activated when D is active. And we'll set it way back here. Whoops. Aux three. Woo, sorry guys, that's my differential thrust. Okay, so you see how it moved it way over? So I want it in this middle setting, I want it to be all the way gone. But now we have to set the offset. I think I'm going the wrong way. There we go. Okay, see how it's moving? So now at this point, we're technically into the like inconsequential amount of... All right, so I'll explain this again here in a second. Okay, so D compared to aux three. This is aux three is commanded and controlled by this knob. That's gonna be our master gain, okay? This is our other master gain. So no matter what position we're in, Ooh, oh, I gotta get this one. This is not to be on, it's to be attached to D, but only when D is in one or two, okay? See this? It goes from whatever we have it set to, see it's at 108, goes to off, goes to off. So that mimics my normal mode of operation so that when I fly this plane, say I've got the stabilizer set to like minus 30 for my normal like really small amount of stabilization, off off. Let's say I have it all the way up for some weird reason. Off. Off. No matter what. And the thing that's cool about that is the stabilizer is still on, which means our flaps are still allowed to work, and it doesn't impact them at all. It just impacts the master gain. Okay? So stabilizer is set all the way up. You can hear it work. Off. Off. On. Here, I'll yaw the plane. And you can, you can see this one move. And you can see this one move as well, okay? So that tells us that our flapper on support's already turned on, but I'm gonna just double check that real quick. So the flapper on support for us is just basically a dip switch setting. So you see none of our stuff is actually turned on at all. So we need to actually technically flip the flapper on. See how it says flapper on there, guys? So which way is on? I always try, okay, so it's already in the on position. Okay, so now if we turn this off, watch what happens. Okay, it's off. This side's working, this side's not. Okay, so we're gonna turn that back on. Okay, so now that we've done that, I'm gonna reset this. It's important to reset that. Now there's a big disadvantage in this configuration, and that is, first of all, the amount of travel on the flap circuit now is very limited. Secondly, if I wanna center my trims for all my controls, normally, I would go to my control and I would turn the stabilizer on and off, on and off, on and off, and it would reset them. You have to do it within like a second. 
See this? It's still on. So you actually have to go in here and remember to unmix all that crap to actually be able to reset this. Okay? That could confuse somebody pretty bad. But how often do you really have to reprogram this, you know, to center the trims? Almost never. Okay? And to be perfectly honest, I don't even know if most people know you can do it. So, um, because I sure as heck didn't know I could do it. Same problem I have on the ASH-26. I can't do it on that easily either. But I've had to, to reset the trims on that too. And that just means that the stabilizer understands that, you know, your trim being off uh, 17 clicks to the left, that's considered central now. Okay, that's all that does. All right, so let's take a look at these servos again real quick. This is short, this is long. We put this in here. Obviously, this is going to be recessed into the servo pocket. So let's see how much movement we get. See that? So we go... So we're getting about an inch of play, maybe three quarters of an inch. Not sure if that's going to be sufficient. All right, folks, I've got some ideas. I'm probably going to have to do some of this thinking off camera here. You see how much throw we're getting there? If I can keep enough torque to actuate these flaps, I might be able to get them to work on this configuration. But like I was saying, I'm probably going to have to do a little thinking about this. But don't worry, I won't leave you high and dry. We'll come back and show you exactly what we did. And I'll show you how to do it yourself too. So anyway, in review, in review, okay, on this plane we have differential thrust, we have um, flap rons. at some point we'll get those programmed in probably not right this second. Uh, we're going to have flaps. We're going to obviously have a deployment delay on that. We're going to have an elevator um, correction. That's going to happen when we deploy flaps. We're going to have, of course, differential thrust, which we already knew about. Um, rudder, steerable nose gear, everything but retracts, guys. So I'm going to be happy with that if I get all that to work. And I've got a little bit ahead of me just trying to get this to work. So come back for more. Don't forget to click the like. Give me a like if you want. And then also uh, check the description. Should be an exhaustive list of all these steps, which is kind of a quick description of what's going on on the, the video because there's a lot of them on this build series. Really appreciate you guys being a part of this. Some of this stuff is tedious. Some of it's painful to watch, I'm sure. But at least it's me and not you, right? Come back for more. Signing out for now. Thanks for watching.